sharing that. Um, as a, what would you offer to, I'll go back to your first point on trust because that seems to be one of the biggest challenges parents have, particularly with teenage children. Uh, what would you like to offer to us beyond what you have said about how parents can build, uh, how they can get into activities to build trust with children and not just parents trusting the children, but also children trusting the parents in a more generic uh, domestic environment rather than you being overseas and parents being back home, you know, kind of stuff. Do you have any other thoughts on that matter? Like, I would definitely say it's a slow process. Like, even with my parents, for example, like, you do it with small things and it's the small things that count. So, for example, like, if you tell your, like, if I tell my dad or mom that I'm going to be doing something, then I do my best to do it because if, if I don't do it, then they'll think of me as being slightly irresponsible. And then the next time I tell them I'm going to do something, it would take a lot more for them to trust that I'm actually going to go ahead with that. So these little things that we do every day play a much bigger role than we would act, than we would think otherwise. So yeah, it's the, I think that would be the biggest thing for me. Like it's not one big thing that leads to trust, but rather the little steps every day that lead to a more trusting relationship. Well said, well said. Okay. Um, May, do we have any questions from the floor for our young folks here? Yes, we do. Okay, first question to Faye. Now, Faye, you mentioned about having judgmental thoughts towards your parents and when you reacted towards them, how you hope your parents will react in order to help you better? Um, so I really think that like, what will help me is that if they maybe ask me more about what I'm feeling, like maybe instead of like reacting, they can ask me more to help me like uh, reflect more on myself and like I understand myself better and know what I'm feeling instead of you know like starting a fight yeah okay thank you and um, for the both of you um, I believe that you have many modules that you can opt for so uh, why did you choose to attend a mindfulness course now, this is a question from uh, one of the attendees you give it the first? Uh, okay. Um, so I just because um, as I said before, I wanted to learn to appreciate life better. So previously, um, before this mindfulness course, I always feel like like I wasn't very like happy, and I I felt like very like it's sort of in the middle. Like I wasn't very sad, but I wasn't very happy either. So like I wanted to do more things to just change that about my life and learn to appreciate my life more. As I said. So that's what motivated me to take the course. And obviously, um, I've heard about it from my friends and they've all said that it was a really like fun experience and good for them as well. So it really motivated me to take this course. Tane, how about you? Um, for me, I think it was quite similar as well. But one thing that I'd learned like over the past, while I was in university was that the biggest distraction for me is like while I'm doing work, I keep talking to my friends or like I start watching videos or something. And then it's a slippery slope. So I wanted to learn how to maintain my focus. And like if I'm doing a certain task, like to maintain all my awareness in the present moment, rather than thinking about all the other things. Because like that would allow me to use my time a lot more productively as well. I'd like to ask uh, both uh, Faye and uh, Tane this question. And I'd like to go back to the first question about uh, um, not being judged and uh, developing a better relationship with parents. One of the things that I have discovered in a number of my uh, experiences with my clients is time. The amount of time that parents have available for their children, right? Now they are in Singapore, for example, uh, there are a number of parents who are, both of them are working and they come back and they don't have very much time uh, even to relate to themselves, let alone uh, relate to the children and attend to the, the needs of the children. So I'd like to hear your views on what you think uh, is the kind of time that you guys need. You know, you are growing up, you know. Uh, how much time did you need from your parents on a daily basis, on a weekly basis? Uh, what do you need uh, the audience time with them for uh, to help you 
uh, become more robust, more resilient, to attend to your problems, your challenges. Can you help me help, help us understand? The parents need to understand how much time they need to give you. You know what I mean? <laughs> Anyone can go. Uh, okay, I think like, again, for me, it's something that's progressive. So like at the beginning, for example, I needed more time for my parents as well. Like when I just moved to Singapore, because it was a very new environment for me and I was very unsure. But then like the more, given that they spent that extra amount of time with me at the beginning, it made me a lot more comfortable here. And so over time, like I needed to spend less and less time with them, like for their support, because they provided me with what they could earlier on. So it's not something that stays constant and probably changes from time to time based on what your child is going through. So maybe like, I, okay, I mean, I don't know how I would say this, but like, it's always good to know what your child is going through. And then based on that, like if they're going through a tough time, definitely you need to spend slightly more time, like just being there for them. Again, you don't have to solve the problem for them, but just show that you're present if they need anything. Okay. Uh, so for me, like, like uh, my parents are actually at home quite a lot. Like my mom is a stay-at-home wife. So like in the past, I would feel like maybe I'm spending too much time with my parents. Like every day, you just update them on like one or two things. So there's actually like not a lot of conversation going on. But after I moved to like RC4 and because I stay on the weekdays only and I come back on the weekends, I feel like on the weekends, there's like more like interaction, like more meaningful conversations because I can update more of a, more to them about what happens in my life. So I feel like, yeah, it's good enough for me to just spend some time on the weekend, like hang out and like watch TV or something like that. Like that's good enough for me. So you would rather interact with your parents um, as and when you want to. In other words, you would rather invite them into your space rather than you go into their <laughs> space. <laughs> Leave me alone. Give me my privacy, my confidentiality. If I need you, I will talk to you about it. If I don't, don't worry about me. Is that is that what you're? Uh, um, a little bit, but I mean, if they want to share with me like their problems as well, I'm I'm okay with that as well. That's nice. <laughs> but, um, That's sometimes, good. like maybe like like when I'm doing work, then my mom will keep like trying to start a conversation with me, and I, I don't know. Like personally, I don't think that's very productive. <laughs> Me. Next question. I don't know whether May is on board or not. Uh, Frank. Um, yeah. Another question. Go ahead, Cheng San. Yes. And this is to both of you, and I think maybe we let the lady go first. What are some of the things that your parents, or maybe not your parents, but typical parents do that hurt people of your age? What annoys you? <laughs> what, do, what do parents do that annoys children, particularly teenagers? I mean, for me, I feel like it's like if they don't trust me, like um i wanted to borrow something from my dad and he was like very like anxious about it like he was scared that i would spoil it i don't know that made me feel like very like a little bit annoyed because i feel like he didn't trust me to do whatever i wanted to do with like his his thing so like what uh tane said earlier trust is something that has to build very slowly over a period of time right so um how can we engage in activities that build the trust? I mean, that the principle is, is, is good, but how, what kind of activities do we have to engage in to build trust uh, between parent and child? Tani? Ooh, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um. Maybe we can just communicate more and like tell each other what we're feeling. So like, you know, knowing each other, knowing each other better helps us to trust each other more as well. One of the ideas I had I proposed earlier is to have a family get together maybe about once a week. 
And in the once a week session, everyone sits at the table and everyone kind of talks about, okay, how did my week go? Including the parents. The parents can say what was great for them, what was not great for them and where they need help. And it goes around the table and everybody can talk about it. No accusations, no pointing fingers, no blaming, complaining, criticizing. It's just that this is how my week was and, and I had this challenge and I'm looking at how I can be assisted in this. And then open up to the, to the table, to the family, to see who can offer whatever thoughts, no matter how young they are. You know, it's, a, a, it's an opportunity for bonding. What do you think about that? Yeah, that, I think like it's nice that everyone over there sits down as equals, like because that generates that trust for like the parent from the child as well, because the child will see like, yeah, my parent is going through all this as well. And despite all that, they're willing to help me out in what I'm going through. So they know that their parents prioritize them in some sense and that helps them trust them more. Okay. Um, so for me, actually my family tried this before and mm -hmm. I think uh, it didn't really work out actually because like sometimes when uh, like uh, me and my sisters would tell someone, uh, tell them like maybe something that they are like, they disapprove of, then they would like start like scolding us about it and then they would like kind of <laughs> rant on about like a lecture and it becomes a lecture, uh, not really a sharing session anymore. So the, the potential yeah. is great, but it's a matter of how we exercise it, right? So mm -hmm. Let's not, let it not become a judgmental session, a criticizing session. It's a session to learn about how the other person's life is going. And I think that kind of information that we have over a period of time helps us understand how everyone's doing. I think that's yeah. more important. Okay. Next question, I mean. There's a question. There's a question here, um, you know, um, for the both of you. I, I think it's important for young people in general to, to have friends and many of you like parents to listen to you but at the same time you like to be left alone and um, and uh, you know um, will you prefer listening ear from parents or you just prefer to talk to your friends instead? In other words, over a period of time there's this, this tendency in, in, in every average family, in an average family, where when teenagers become teenagers, they drift away from the family. The first family now are my friends. The second family is my nuclear family, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a tendency, right? This is a pattern. How can we basically uh, not have that happen? How can we find that balance between friends and family? Uh, personally, for me, I just think that like sometimes I wouldn't want to share things with my parents because like I know that they will have something to say about it. You know, as I mentioned before, like when you tell them something they disapprove of, they tend to like go into like a lecture and then it doesn't really become very like fun anymore. So in the end, you just end up sharing your thoughts with your friends. And I think actually what you said previously was a good idea. Like you have a family gathering of some sort. And then maybe you can set some ground rules so that like nobody would kind of be judging each other. How about you, Tony? Yeah, I think exactly the same. Like perhaps the reason is that our friends provide a space for us to share our feelings without the fear of being judged. And like that, that makes us feel a lot safer in saying how we feel. Whereas for our parents, they might think of it from a different perspective and then it'll turn into a lecture. Uh, and also perhaps it's because sometimes it, the parents shouldn't feel bad about it, but it might just be that what the child is going through is a lot more relevant just to his generation. Like, and so he might feel like my parents wouldn't understand what I'm going through. So in that case, perhaps it's okay for him to just be sharing it with his friends because sharing it with his parents doesn't seem very helpful to him. So just to continue with that, to help uh, the, the participant uh, answer that question, what do you both understand about what your parents want for you? What are their, what are their fears? What are their, their, their worries? Um, what do you think? What is your perspective about what they worry about for you? Um, I mean, for me, I think my parents worry like a lot about my studies. Like they are always like saying like, I mean, they are always mentioning that they are afraid that I wouldn't like, get a good job in the future or like I don't have good grades and stuff like that. So I don't know. I think that's their main concern for me. Yeah. You said, you said, a, you said a real concern, you think? 
do you think they should worry about this thing or should they just leave it to you? And if you have an issue and you have a concern, you will walk up to them and ask them some assistance. But should they worry unnecessarily about that? Because that worry uh, takes them away from actually relating to you, right? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Like, so is it, a, is it a valid worry, you think? Uh, I think it's valid for any parent to be concerned about their child. But I don't think it's valid that they like, unnecessarily worry about these kind of things. And so how would you help them? How would you help them contain this, this worrisome exuberance that they always keep showing? <laughs> <laughs> Tane, how would you help them manage these worries? Uh, what do you think? Uh, so for me, I think it's I try to talk them through my thought process. So like when I come to a decision, like I understand why I've made that decision, but then they might not understand it from my perspective. And like, I know at the end of the day, they want me to be happy, right? So like, that's why they worry for me. Like, they'll tell me, oh, you should do this. Because in their mind, if I do it, I'll be happy. But then like for me, like, so whenever I make a decision, I kind of show them why I'm making this decision and how it makes me happy. So it, in a way for them, it's like, oh, he's going to be happy. So it's okay. And it, it allows them to sit back and let me do what I want to do. But at the same, and let go of their worries about my own happiness. Okay, thank you. Cheng San, do you have the next question? Yes, I do. And the next question is, it is sometimes a bit ironic uh, whereby you have youth that says that they want more time from the parents but then on other occasions, when the parents want more time, the youth say, oh, I'm too busy. So maybe Frank, I want to start with you first. What, what do you see from the perspective of a parent? I think that allocation of time, I mean, I need, I need time with my kids. The question is, what do I want to do? What do I want to do in that time? Hmm. If I'm going to use that time to worry about them, to criticize them, uh, to judge them uh, for my, because of my worries, then they, are not, they don't want the time with us anymore. If the kids want time with their parents, the parents must be able to show trust and respect, and the parents must be able to say, yeah, I'm going to get surprised from time to time with my kid, but I'm willing to take it on, I'm willing to see what I can do to help them uh, get through this roller coaster in life because there is going to be a roller coaster. So if I'm going to jump in there every time as a helicopter parent, remove obstacles from them, uh, not allow them to make mistakes, then they're going to turn around and say, okay, um, I will rather live on my own and do my own thing. I think so. Uh, we, I like the, 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 the kids to answer this, you know. Um, so I think for the, if kids want to have time with their parents, they, the parents must be seen as coaches, as mentors, that they can go, go to, a go-to point uh, for their problems in their life. But if the teacher, if, if the parents are seen as the discipline master of the school, uh, the uh, RSM in an army, then they're not going to come to you because mm -hmm. they would rather go to their friends and, and post the same questions and try and find an answer. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it can be confusing maybe for parents because like we ask for more time, but then we want to be left alone. But it's actually just like what type of things that you're doing, like what type of time they want from you. Like we want maybe more quality time instead of like lecture time. Mm -hmm. So like instead of, you know, like lecture, using the time that you spend with your child to lecture them, maybe it will be more productive to, you know, just like listen and have a conversation, a nice conversation. What is a nice conversation? Like um, just listening to each other and just joking around, like not taking whatever we say too seriously and like not really reading too much into it. Something that you do with your friends, right? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. How about you, Tanning? Yeah, to me, I feel like one of the most productive ways I spend time with my parents is just playing board games together. Because like, yeah, it, it's, 
a safe space for all of us to just have fun and it has very little chance of like translating into something like other than being fun so it's a nice place to start of spending time together meaningfully and again given that like in everyday life we might be going through something that we feel our parents might not relate to like in that case it might be hard to find a topic of meaningful conversation right so in that sense like instead of forcing ourselves to talk about something like why not just spend time together doing something we all enjoy and what would that be um i mean sitting down and just watching a movie going for a ride a car ride is not going to be meaningful right yeah yeah what would be a meaningful activity where you think uh, you will enjoy time with your parents and your parents may enjoy time with you i think like a few that we've used in the past like one of them is playing charades together so like the good thing about charades is that like it forces you to like act a bit funny sometimes and like again that helps you like break down the barriers that you might have and lets you let go of judgments you might hold for one another and like there's this other like mobile game called i think it's called psych or something along those lines like because in that way you kind of learn what the other people think about you and like because it's in a game version it you you're able to enjoy it a lot more as well how about you fay um actually my mom like she likes to bake so um sometimes i would bake with her and because i'm pretty bad at this kind of thing so it's pretty funny to like <laughs> like work me like be clumsy around the kitchen so i think i think when we bake we have a lot of fun okay next question me i'm so sorry that uh, my internet you know get okay. logging me out. Uh at the moment there are no open questions, but I do have one uh for both Tane and Fei. Like in uh, you've learned in mindfulness there are various uh, foundational values. So which one do you think is the most critical for you to have in order to or to apply in order that you will strengthen the relationship with your parents? um i think for me maybe it's gratitude because like if you are grateful to your parents then you will you know have less judgmental thoughts because that's your attitude towards your parents like being grateful so i think this is the foundation of it all like if you are grateful you are less likely to have judgmental thoughts towards them uh in my case i think it's been more of trust like again so now whenever like my parents come to me and give me any advice like i approach it from the point of view that they're doing this because they care about me and so like i'm going to trust their intentions behind it so that way whatever advice they give whether like it's something that i like or not i'm still able to take it in a more positive light and at the same time like them trusting me allows them to give me the freedom to like explore by myself and make my own decisions without having to interfere every now and then which allows me to be happier as well hey thank you both uh, pay and tani so there's another question here um you know nowadays the digital age we are all uh, very hooked to our gadgets and devices so how do you think your parents can um, get your attention sometimes <laughs> i because a lot of children spend a lot of time on their gadgets yeah um maybe like i maybe it's not super relevant but i know that i have a friend whose mom is actually quite active on instagram and i don't know but i think that maybe that has actually helped him really a lot better as well as like look at what his mom is doing as well so i think that maybe just getting on social media can be fun for you as well as maybe help you understand your child more yeah and like i feel like yeah there's you can try use technology to your advantage as well so like come up with like a mobile game or something that you you know your child plays and if you start playing that game together like it could be another way for you to bond with them and spend time together without having to compete with their mobile phone like cuz you're now working together with it to get their time instead i think i think the um, the concern behind the question is when do when can parents have more face to face time with their children and are they competing with the devices 
because for them, the face-to-face -face time is so important. I mean, they, they did that for 13 years, right? Face-to-face -face with the kids, right? Now the kids are even getting onto their devices much earlier. So they're using the face-to-face -face time. And the face-to-face -face time is so important to build a relationship, the trust, the connection, the understanding, and, and so there's a tendency and everyone worries about that, that the face-to-face -face time is being eroded over time and they're losing out to the devices that they had, right? So what can we do? What can children do to provide the parents that face-to-face -face time that they need and yet also uh, have their device time that they want? I think maybe like, because there'll be certain times that we won't be using our phone, like maybe like we are less likely to use our phone, maybe like during meal times, like you can just have a like one ground rule where we we don't um use our phones during meal times and like that's the only exception that you have so that they can have their own freedom as well as you having more face to face interaction. Good one. Danny? For me, like I think from a child's perspective, it like to me it's always been about perception. So for me personally, like how I think about it is I can use my phone whenever I want to. But like the time that I have with my parents is a lot more limited and therefore more valuable. So yeah, like by reframing it in my mind in that sense, I'm able to like put aside my gadgets for whenever my parents are around me so that we can talk to each other. So like just thinking about it from a different angle and like seeing what's at stake helps me like personally come to make the decision to spend more face-to-face -face time. Can I pose a question for you guys? Um, I'm not too sure whether parents understand what the, the worries are for the new generation, for the young generation, people like yourself. As you're coming out of university and you're going to launch yourself into the work world, what are your concerns? What are your worries? Um, Maybe the parents uh, out there at large can, can, can get some understanding from you guys. You know, what worries you about your future, you know? I mean, for me, it's just like normal things like getting internships and like wondering whether my course will be like relevant or whether my course can even get a good job, these kind of things. Yeah, like mostly worrying about internships if you're talking about future. Okay, relationships, cost of living, houses. <laughs> oh my quality. god, maybe I haven't thought that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the initial entry, right? For you, the biggest concern is the initial entry into the work yeah. world, right? Internship and the first job, right? Mm. But you haven't had the time to even think beyond that. Okay, yeah. how about you, Tan? <laughs> how about you, Tan? Like, okay, I think. Again, this is just more like, I don't know if it applies to everyone, but for me on a personal level, like it's always this concern. Like I see that I have to make so many choices, but like among all this, like how do I make sure that I'm doing something that's good for the world at the end of the day? And like, where do I strike that balance between my own happiness and like making the world a better place? Because there might be some sort of sacrifice I have to make. So like that's something that I usually end up thinking about quite a lot. What kind of skills do you need, you think, to, to be effective in the place of work where you're going to end up in one day? What are the skills that you think you need uh, to build on from now so that, or even before this, in your institutions, in your schooling, did you get any of this kind of skills building that you think you need when you go out there into the workplace? Do you have it? <laughs> The best thing university taught me was how to study for like an exam the night before. Like it teaches you how to le learn as fast as you can. And I think like going out into the working world again, there's so many unknowns. Like you're going to have to be used to like taking in new information and making decisions based on that. So like in the school sense, that's probably been a good learning experience. Okay. okay. Um, I think probably communication skills. Because uh, I think I remember when I went to internship, like, like everybody was like so different from me and it was like quite hard to communicate and like be friends with them. So I think your communication skills are really important. Um, also maybe, yeah, like what Tani mentioned, like decision making skills. Like um, sometimes like personally in school, because a lot of decisions are like made for you. So you can 
end up being very indecisive. But I guess maybe in the workplace, you need to have a mind of your own and like make more decisions. Yeah, maybe something that I would like to work on. Can your parents help you acquire some of the skills? Build down some of the skills? Um, I'm not sure, but my, my dad talks to me a lot about it. But maybe I need more real life applications. So it would be nice if my dad could allow me to make more decisions about my life. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, yeah. I support that. Yeah. Uh, me? Anything else there out there? Yeah, there's actually a question about disciplining uh, teenagers, you know. Um, but I'm not too sure whether you were disciplined before. Like, <laughs> you really have a lot of disagreement with your parents or you have done something wrong and they will discipline you. Um, how would they be effective to let you learn that you're wrong and yet you're not resentful towards them? Hmm. I mean, uh, personally, I, I don't know. I don't have that much experience with this. Because, I mean, even though my parents, like, they nag a lot and sometimes I feel annoyed with them, I think that, it, like, eventually the message, like, did somewhat sink in a little bit, even though it's, like, maybe not to the extent that they wanted it to, but it sunk in for me. And even though in that moment I resented them a little bit, but afterwards when you look back on it, you're, like, grateful for them for teaching you these values. So maybe, I'm not sure, like, personally, I'm not sure how you would get around it, but... um. I don't think that like your child would hate you forever if you nag at them a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think like Percy, I've been thinking about just all these rules in general a lot recently. And what I realized is like, I think whenever you come up with a rule that you want your child to follow, it would be very important to try to explain why that rule is important to follow. Because if you just say no eating food in bed after 9 p.m., but you don't give a reason for that, then they'll just think of you as this power who's ex like, or this person who's exerting their power over them. And at the same time, what they'll realize is that it's okay for them to do that action as long as they don't get caught. Because like, if the only thing you're going to be doing is punishing them if they get caught and they never get caught, then it's okay for them to do that. But on the other hand, if you show them like the essence or like the actual value of doing something or not doing something, then they're more willing to be like they're more likely to accept that lesson than like reject it. What if they don't accept it? What if the child doesn't accept it? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it happens, right? It happens. So what you're saying is rules, boundaries, um, un unwritten rules, written rules, all this must come out very clearly and it must be explained. There must be an understanding on both sides between the parent and the child, right? Yeah. And especially when you get older, that, that, that to do that is even more necessary. And understanding consequences, if you don't uh, abide by those boundaries and those rules, must be also clearly understood. And if that is a, a breach, if there's a deviation, then there must be a clear understanding of what the punishment is going to be like. And that punishment can also be negotiated, right? <laughs> right? It can be negotiated. And then... If there is going to be a punishment, then there must be a very quick explanation that follows up after the punishment as to why it had to be done, particularly when the punishments were not covered in the first place. <laughs> so I think this clarity of why we do things and not doing things from a position of power, but doing things from a position of wisdom from the part of the parents is very important for the learning process for children. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, really? you know, when you mentioned like, what if the child doesn't accept the rule? Like it might also be a good time for you to think about why the rule is being implemented in the first place and like try and understand the reason behind why the child doesn't accept it. Like, because at the end of the day, like the way they're thinking is very different from the way you're thinking. And unless you come to a complete understanding of each other, like you might just end up fighting over something trivial. True. Um, yeah. And maybe like something that can help to discipline a little bit more. Like if you want your child to do something, maybe just try to make it like, like not too drastic a change or anything like small steps first so that mm. it's more like achievable because like to motivate someone you need to make like the goal like achievable like smart goals so there's something that can be done mm. requires a lot of patience <laughs> a lot of perseverance on the part of the parents right <laughs> yes me anything else 
Uh, I'm taking over for now, Frank, and uh, okay. I, uh, let's take the last two questions. So, yeah. hey, can I check with you? If let's say, you know, um, parents in general always want to talk about only study and career, what do you think the youth can do to get them to change the topic? Hmm, um, I, maybe you can suggest like to do other sort of activities and like not talk or maybe you can just change the topic on your own you know like talk about some other aspect of your life <laughs> and you, hopefully they will st- I don't know personally I'll just I will just change the topic and hopefully they will stop talking about academics yeah I, maybe like just something else interesting that happened in your week or something like that I'm not very sure about this okay but I think you probably nail it on the head in the sense that maybe talking about something that maybe it's not study and it's not uh, related to career, but something that you are interested in. I think in, in most cases, cases, parents are still you know, keen to hear what their children are interested in, not necessarily just study and career. Now, Atane, um, when you are younger, what kind of uh, words or action from your parents would kind you kind of make you want to like uh, stop hearing? You know, your com- the conversation just become blur. You just go into a different space. <laughs> uh, I think like there wasn't any like one action or anything. I think the only thing to me was if my parents would say no for something and then not give me a reason. Like, if they say no and then I ask them, but why not? And then they say, because I said so or something like that. Then, like, I, I would feel like I'm not being listened to and I don't understand their point of view at all. So, at that point in time, I, there'd be nothing left for me to say either. Thank you. I think... I think uh, yeah, fine. Right, go, go ahead, go ahead. Thanks. I think that was... Uh, uh, I'm I'm much older than both of you, but maybe a few years younger than Frank. And uh, when uh, when that question will pop up in the Q and A, I I have the same uh, response as you, Tanya. So I think it's very universal across many generation. Uh, yeah. Uh, would you like to do a closing? Um, I'm back now. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> Thank Frank, you. you I, I would like to add. I would like to add that um, really when we listen to our children, um, it's, it's always be reminded not to dismiss them, whatever they tell us, okay? And keep the communication channel open. Now, I'd like to thank the, um, Faye and Tani today for <laughs> you know, sharing their experiences. That has been very insightful. And I'd like to thank the parents and all the attendees uh, for joining us today. Now, although you know, we can't be perfect parents, and, um, but there are, there are many ways to learn to be good parents. And I would like to encourage you to continue learning. I, I think that, you know, um, I'd like to applaud your effort really you know, to joining us in this webinar and learning and listening to others. That's, that's really um, wonderful, wonderful. So I'd like to encourage you to continue to apply what you have learned and uh, wish you the very best. So, Can I- Say something here in closing, also, please, Sami. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, uh, great job, uh, Tane. Great job, Faye. Um, I'd like to leave a little uh, 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 a message for everyone. There's an article in today's Straight Times in the Future Live uh, about innovative, resilient kids in the new world. I'm not too sure whether you guys have read that. It's a very interesting article, and I think it talks about how to prepare the kids today for the future world. What are the skills and what are the attributes we need to build in our kids today for the future unpredictable world? And I think it's a very good article. But I think one thing that article mentioned was a particular book, a book written by, I think it's really Yuval Noah Harari. And the title of the book is 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. I think it's going to be a great book for educators, parents, and children, and teenagers like yourself. And I hope you can get a copy of that and browse through that. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, May.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Um, for the attendees, please join us. We we'll have another two youth that will share their mindfulness journey next Sunday, 4 p.m. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.